arahato sama sambutasa buddhang damang sanggang namasami. Okay, here we go. Greetings from Newberry Buddhist Monastery. For those who are overseas, we are located in Victoria, Melbourne, Mel, uh, Victoria, New, uh, Australia. And today's event is actually the result of the curiosity of somebody from the citizens group. We want to thank him for his curiosity, which resulted in what we have today. Okay, and that is a uh, calf when he asks, um, what is the history of the bhikkhunis? And what is the significance of NBM, Newberry Buddhist Monastery? So because of these two little questions, we thought that, okay, perhaps we can actually turn it into a program uh, to, to, to uh, impart uh, information to everybody who may be as curious as Calf. So thank you, Calf. All right, but before we go further, let me first introduce you to the nuns who are sitting here with me, the Newberry Buddhist Monastery nuns. Of course, we have Aya Santa who is behind us, the scene. He, she will show her face later on. Um, to my left, which uh, I see on my right, is uh, Bikuni Suvira. Behind her, uh, Aya Sankapha. And I have Sela, Aya Sela, and Aya San, uh, Sunyata. Okay. And of course, I'm Upika. And of course, um, we have um, another member who is staying with us, someone who is actually uh, one of the very important persons uh, who uh, helped to revive the Bikuni lineage in Sri Lanka. And of course, you will soon get to meet uh, Ranjani De Silva, who is also doing a presentation here. So tonight's presentation is actually uh, the joint efforts of the nuns here, right? And then, of course, um, we have a job for each and every one of here, uh, which each and every one of the nuns here. Uh, Sunita will be doing the uh, chanting at the end of the program. So, without further ado, please let me hand you over to Carl, the representative for Citizen. Carl, all yours. Thank you, Ayopeka. Um, so, welcome everyone to this event. And um, yeah, we're really fortunate to um, have you all here. Um, so as, as Iopeka mentioned, uh, this event is a collaborative event between Citizen, which is the young adults group uh, of the BSV, um, and also BSV and Newbury Monastery. Um, so as Iopeka mentioned, this event was really inspired by my recent stay at um, Newbury Monastery um, and talking to uh, the nuns and uh, Ranjani Aunty, um, and hearing the amazing stories, or well, some of the amazing stories um, that not the nuns uh, in Buddhism have gone through over the years. And it really inspired me, um, and I hope it inspires um, all of you, and uh, makes you, it really made me very grateful for having Newbury Monastery um, so close to me. So, um, I just, uh, before we hand it over to Ayasanta, I just wanted to mention that, um, so we'll be taking questions um, after a video that Ayasanta um, really uh, um, helped prepare and um, that all the, the nuns and Ranjini Aunty um, put in a lot of effort into. And so um, you can ask these questions on the Zoom uh, chat and if you're on YouTube, um, also on the on YouTube live, and um, we'll be uh, uh, we'll be getting Quincy, the citizen president, to answer those questions. Um, so I think that's it from me, and I'd just like to hand it over to Aya Santa um, for to play the video. There she is. And the one who is always behind the scene, the one who is responsible for the Sunday Dharma talks, the Monday uh, audio meditation, uh, a lot of other events. She's always the one behind the scene. We would like to thank her for bringing the uh, gift of Dharma to everybody. Thank you, Aya Santa. All yours now.
Hi, it's Aya Sivira here, and today I'll be talking about the life of Mahapajapati Gautami and the formation of the Bhikkhuni Order. So let's begin by paying homage to the Buddha with the words of Mahapajapati Gautami in the Terigatha. Homage to the Buddha, the hero, supreme among all beings, who made me, as well as many others, find release from dukkha. Um, to be honest, when they gave me this topic, I was feeling a little bit nervous. Um, you know, obviously, the formation of the Buddhist nuns order is a very inspiring topic, one that's very important to us as bhikkhunis. But the reason, you know, why I, why I was feeling a little bit nervous about this um, is because there is a little bit of ambiguity in the texts um, which relate to the foundation of the nun's order, um, particularly in relation to Mahabhajapati Gautami's going forth story as found in the Anguttara Nikaya and in the Chulavaga. So I was thinking, um, you know, how do we find a way to actually deal with this ambiguity and to create an integrated narrative of Mahapajapati Gautami's life um, that can be inspiring and actually make sense to people. So I have actually identified five themes that we will be using to help explore Mahapajapati Gautami's life today. So they are in order, relationships, journey, persistence, miracles and memory. So keep them in mind as those will be the themes we'll be using um, to explore a little bit further. So when I think of Mahapajapati Gautami, the first thing that comes to mind is really her relationships because um, Mahapajapati Gautami was the Lord Buddha's foster mother. She was also um, the sister of the Buddha's biological mother who was Queen Mahamaya. So both um, Queen Mahamaya and Mahabhajapati Gautami were Kolian princesses. So they came from what would now be modern day Nepal. Um, and you know what happened after Queen Mahamaya passed away after the Buddha's birth, um, Mahabhajapati Gautami had had a son at around the same time, Nanda. So she actually agreed to become the Buddha's foster mother. And because both sisters were married to King Suddhodana, um, after Queen Mahamaya died, Mahabhajapati Gautami became the chief consort. So um, this relationship that the Buddha has with uh, Mahabhajapati Gautami, you know, that she was the one who suckled him, um, does turn up later in the, in the story of the nun's order. Um, as an important theme in Mahabhajapati's um, life. So the second theme I wanted to look at in terms of, you know, how can we understand uh, Mahabhajapati Gautami and the formation of the Bhikkhuni order in a coherent way um, is the theme of journey. So after his awakening, the Buddha journeyed back to his hometown of Kapilavatu, which, um, where he met his family. Uh, after that, Mahabhajapati Gautami became a stream enterer and there was a very famous event where she made an offering of a robe uh, to the Lord Buddha and this event is recorded in the Dakana Vibhanga Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. Um, so after the Buddha came to Kapilavatu, King Suddhodana attained arahanship and passed away. You can see in the image there, um, there's an image of, of a dispute that occurred um, between the Sakyans and the Kolians, which was resolved through the Buddha's preaching, the Buddha himself being half Sakyan and half Kolian. After that, 500 men became monks and their 500 widows remained, taking Mahapajapati Gautami as their leader. In the fifth year of the Buddha's ministry at Kapilavatu, Mahapajapati Gautami and the 500 Sakyan women shaved their heads and donned ochre robes to follow the Buddha and request ordination. Um, so this is where this theme of journey is coming in. They followed the Buddha on foot from Kapilavatu to Vaisali. And I do actually have a picture, a map. This map is, uh, was created by Deepak Anand. 
um, which actually shows their journey from Kapilavatu all the way to Vaisali. Um, it's not a walk in the park. This trek is actually about 320 kilometers long and would take 10 to 15 days on foot. Another thing about this part of the world is that there are also wild animals such as tigers. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not something to be taken lightly. You know, thinking about the difficulties of the journey, um, that ties into the third theme I wanted to talk about um, when we're thinking about, you know, who Mahapajapati Gotami was and the foundation of the nun's order, and that third theme is persistence. So after arriving in Vaisali, Mahapajapati Gotami requested ordination as a bhikkhuni. Through the intervention of Venerable Ananda, the permission was granted. Uh, her acceptance of the Garidhammas became her ordination. The Garidhammas are the set of eight rules which legally and socially subordinate the bhikkhuni order to the bhikkhu order. I mean, it's there in the story, but it's not the main thing I'd like to talk about today. Um, because what I want to talk about is actually the fact that Mahabhajapati Gotami's insistence in requesting ordination, despite the Buddha's initial refusal, has been read negatively in some circles. Um, you know, which is a bit like that's really interesting that it has been read that way because, you know, we would have thought um, that obviously the foundation of the Bhikkhuni order should be a high point for Buddhism. So, you know, that leads us to wonder what's actually going on with this negativity. So we'll be coming back to that point later. In the texts of other schools, the Lichavi kings offered a nunnery for the newly ordained 500 Bhikkhunis um, at at Vaisali. So I have a picture there that shows modern day Vaisali, the Ananda Stupa, you know, maybe somewhere near there. Soon after her ordination, Mahabhajapati Gotami attained Arahantship. All of the 500 nuns also attained Arahantship at the conclusion of the discourse on Nandika's advice. In the texts of other schools, Mahabhajapati Gotami plays an active role in the development of the Bhikkhuni Vinaya. The Buddha declared Mahabhajapati Gotami the most senior of the nuns. He said, This is the foremost of my nun disciples, monastics, amongst those who are senior, that is to say, Mahabhajapati Gotami. And the image there, um, that's actually an image from uh, Myanmar um, of Mahabhajapati Gotami and, you know, some Arahant Bhikkhunis. Um, you know, which brings us, you know, to the fourth theme that I was able to identify in Mahabhajapati Gotami's life, which is her miracles. At the age of 120, Mahabhajapati Gotami had chosen to enter Parinibbana, and the 500 nuns followed suit and also entered Parinibbana. This is recorded in the Gotami Apadana, as well as the texts of other schools. So that Gotami Apadana, it is available online, both at apadanatranslation.org and it's sort of central if anyone would like to read in their own time. But before entering Parinibbana, Gotami sought forgiveness from the Buddha. The text references perceived negativity about her earlier insistence. Gotami said, Chief of the world, it is believed that women make every error. If there's any error in me, Forgive it, mine of compassion. I begged you over and again for ordination of women. If I was an error in that, forgive it, O bull among men. O hero, with your permission, I instructed the Buddhist nuns. If I gave bad advice in that, forgive it, Lord of forgiveness. The Buddha replied, What's to forgive in one who's adorned with virtue? What more am I going to say to you when you're going to Nirvana? So from the Apadana passage, we can see that Mahapajapati Gotami is without fault. The Buddha, who is the Lord of Forgiveness, had only praise for her. This passage 
should really be reminding us of the Buddha's essential quality, which is his compassion. The Buddha is a mine of compassion. Of course the Buddha forgives Godami fully. She never did anything wrong. Why did we even have to ask? The Buddha continues, There are fools who doubt that women too gain dhamma penetration. To dispel that wrong view of theirs, display miracles go to me. Then bowing to the Sun Buddha and rising up into the sky with the Buddha's ascent, go to me displayed various miracles. She displayed miracles in various postures and entered into the fire element. This event actually parallels the Lord Buddha's Parinibbana very closely in motifs like Mahavajapati's entry into meditative attainments in forwards and reverse order. The Buddha additionally praises her wisdom, divine ear, divine eye, dhamma knowledge and skill in preaching. After the Parinibbana, the Buddha requested Ananda to assemble the monks to honor Mahapajapati's body. And I'll just read out the verse because I feel it's very inspiring. Um, actually, the Apadana in general, um, the Gautami Apadana, is just a really lovely um, piece of literature. And I'd strongly recommend that people read it if they haven't already, um, just because it's one of those things that you know will actually give you goosebumps. Um, anyway, the verse states, each with faith in the well gone one and each of the sage's pupils ought now to come that Buddha's son to honor the Buddha's mother. Hearing that, the monks came with speed, even those living far away. After the cremation, only relics remained. Um, Mahabhajapati Gotami was an arahant, uh, so she had destroyed the seed of rebirth. Um, so only the relics were left. The Buddha exclaimed, Oh, it's a marvellous thing, my mother who's reached Nirvana, leaving only relics behind. At the Buddha's request, Ananda took the relics and placed them in her arms bowl, after which they were given to the Lichavi princes. And I have something interesting on the slide as well, because you can see that, um, that hillock, you know, it's got a few trees, um, I don't know if you can see, like there's rice paddy, um, a few local uh, farmers, um, maybe some type of palm tree. Um, this, you know, these hillocks or these ancient mounds, this one is um, near modern Burpur, near Vaishali. Um, but this has actually been identified tentatively as being the site of Mahapajapati's stupa. So none of these have been excavated. Um, but, you know, in the region, there's signs that would be very encouraging, like, for example, the presence of um, ancient pottery shards. So, um, you know, we'll see what the future holds in terms of the excavation of these sites. Um, so how this site was able to be identified um, was on the basis of one of the Chinese uh, travellers to India, uh, which was the monk, uh, Xuanzang. Um, on the basis of his description. So that brings me um, to our final theme, you know, talking about the stupa. What we're talking about is memory. So how, how should we remember Mahabhajapati Gotami? What happens when we only look at a very limited range of sources is that we can actually end up with a smaller than life picture of Mahabhajapati Gotami. You know, which probably isn't what we want to do, um, because obviously the woman we're dealing with, you know, she was an arahant, she was the founder of the Buddhist nuns order. Um, we don't want to accidentally paint her as being somehow smaller than she really was. So what we can do um, to try to correct that, that um, errone erroneous tendency um, is we can look at a wider range of sources. And, you know, by also looking at the Apadana sources, um, we can see Mahapajapati Gotami as someone who in many ways lived, breathed and shared in the Buddha's mission and who mirrored the Buddha's own qualities in a very close way. She was close to the Buddha, she was an awakened being, she was an active co-participant in the Buddha's teaching mission and in the creation of the Bhikkhuni Order and the Bhikkhuni Vinaya. She was a teacher of the three assemblies who was respected by monks, she was worthy of a stupa, she had her Parinibbana attended personally by the Buddha and by senior disciples. 
Um, she was an attainer of Parinibbana after displaying meditative attainment, very much like the Buddha himself. And all of these features have actually led some people to give Mahabhajapati Gotami the title of the Buddha for women. So it's pretty, pretty impressive stuff. Um, so that's actually the end of my presentation. There'll be questions at the end. Thank you for listening. Hello, I'm Aya Sela. I'm presenting the establishment of Bhikkhuni lineage in Sri Lanka. According to many sources, chronicles such as Deepavamsa, Mahavamsa and early Brahmi inscriptions. By the time of Emperor Ashoka, 3rd century BCE, Buddhism was well established in India. Ashoka sent his son Mahinda Thera to Sri Lanka to teach the Dhamma and establish Bhikkhuni Sangha. Princess Anula, the sister-in-law of the king Devanampiyathissa of Sri Lanka, with 500 women, met Mahinda Thera. Mahinda Thera established the Bhikkhu order for men. Thousands of women, including Princess Anula, converted to Buddhism and wished to be ordained into the Bhikkhuni order. Thera Mahinda advised the king to write to Emperor Asoka and seek the services of his younger sister, Thera Sangamitta, who was very learned in Dhamma and Vinaya, to be sent to Sri Lanka to perform the Bhikkhuni ordination. King Thissa then chose his minister, Prince Areta, his nephew, to go to India to invite Sangamitta Theri. About Sangamitta Theri. Sangamitta was the second child of Asoka and younger sister of Mahinda. She was born in Ojain, present day Ujin, in Madhya Pradesh in India. Her mother Devi was the first wife of Asoka. Sangamitta was married at the age of 14 to Agri Brahmi, a nephew of Emperor Ashoka, who later was ordained as a bhikkhu. She had a son, Sumana, who became a Samanera and went along with his uncle Mahinda to Sri Lanka. Her teacher was Ayupala Theri. She was ordained at the age of 18 into Theravada Buddhist order by her preceptor Dhammapala. Her brother Mahinda was also ordained at the same time. With her dedicated perseverance to Dhamma, she became an Arahatheri and resided in Pataliputra, known as Patna. Following this invitation from the King Thissa and also the request made by his son Mahinda, Asoka sent Sangamitta Theri with a retinue of ten other learned bhikkhunis to accompany her and to give ordination to the Sri Lanka's Princess Anula and other women. Ashoka was initially worried about sending his daughter away, but Sangamitta herself persisted that she would like to go to Sri Lanka. Arahat bhikkhuni Sangamitta, at the age of 32, travelled to Sri Lanka by sea carrying a sapling of Bodhi tree in a golden vase. She landed at Jambukola in the north of Sri Lanka near Prasende Jaffna. King Thissa herself received Sangamitta and the sapling of the Bodhi tree. They were then ceremonially escorted by the king and his people to Anuradhapura. They entered at the northern gate of Anuradhapura along a road sprinkled with white sand. The Bodhi sapling was planted in the Mahamemdanga grove in Anuradhapura. It is still seen at the same location. The names of the ten bhikkhunis who accompanied Sangamitta were Uttara, Hema, Pasadapala, Agimitta, Dasika, Pegu, Pabata, Mata, 
Malla and Dhamma Dasiya. Peri Sangamitta resided in a monastery named Upasika Vihara within the city of Anuradhapura and established the Bhikkhuni order by ordaining Princess Anula and her group of 500 women as Bhikkhunis. Another monastery named Hattal Hakka Vihara was built for Teri Sangamitta as she wished to lead a solitary life. The Bhikkhuni Sangha flourished in Sri Lanka. Sangamitta Teri died at the age of 79 during the time of King Uttia at her residence in Hattal Hakka Vihara in Anuradhapura. King Uktia performed her last rites. The occasion was also marked with observances in her honour throughout Sri Lanka for one week. She was cremated at the east of the Tuparama near the Chittasala in front of the Bodhi tree. The location for the cremation had been selected by the Teri herself before her death. A stupa was erected by Uttia over her ashes. Bikuni Anula Super is also located in Mihintale near Anuradhapura. It is clear from the Deepavansa account that soon after its establishment, the Bikuni Sangha spread throughout the island. The order consisted of women of all ages from all levels of society and at least whose names are mentioned were well versed in the scriptures and imparted their knowledge to others. There was a strong tradition of learning and teaching among the nuns and their strength was the study and exposition of the Vinaya or rule of discipline. From the start of the Bukkani Sasana in ancient Sri Lanka, the kings built aramas or monastic residences for the Bhikkhuni community. There have been instances where the inscriptions mention about building residences for Bhikkhunis. Ashoka Rama at Pankulia in Anuradhapura is a vast monastic complex with ruins of a bathhouse for the Bhikkhunis built by about the 4th century CE. The Sri Lankan nuns led delegation to foreign lands to spread the Bhikkhu Buddhism and establish the Bhikkhuni Sangha. The Chinese biographies of nuns written in the 6th century mentions that in 429 and 432 CE, two groups of nuns arrived in China from Sri Lanka and they were housed in a nunnery in the capital, learned the Chinese language and ordained 300 Chinese nuns. The political unrest at the end of the 10th century CE led to the cessation of the Bhikkhuni Sasana in ancient Sri Lanka. Hello, I'm Vedabo Sankapa. I will continue with the spread of the Bhikkhuni lineage to China and northern countries in Asia. After the Bhikkhuni lineage began with Mahapajapati Gautami's ordination by the Buddha himself, Bhikkhuni ordination was spread to Sri Lanka by Mahapajapati Sangamitta in the 3rd century BCE. Sri Lanka was the first country outside India where the Bhikkhuni Sasana was established. This Bhikkhuni lineage, which continued and flourished until 1017 CE, was passed on by the Sri Lankan Bhikkhunis to the Chinese nuns in the 5th century. So how the first Bhikkhuni ordination in China started? Soon after Buddhism arrived in China, a number of Chinese women showed an interest in becoming nuns. However, before the 5th century, Chinese Buddhist nuns could not receive high ordination because there was no established Bhikkhuni order in China. 
When the first ordination of women took place in China in the beginning of the 4th century, the ceremony was carried out in the presence of monks only. Since nun witnesses were at that time not available in China, the Bikuni Sangha in China began with Bikuni Jingjiang, who resided in Chuling Temple in Luoyang. The ten men rules were given to her by Venerable Nanagiri, who had come to China circa 313 CE from Kashmir, India. Later, she, together with three other women, took their full ordination on a floating platform in Loyan from Bikku Gunavarman of Kashmir. Let's move to transmission of Bikuni lineage from Sri Lanka. The Bishuni Chuang, which translates into English as Biography of the Nuns, compiled by Aochan in 520 CE, and Biographies of Bhikkhus Gunavarman and Sangavarman, who were in China, give detailed accounts of how the Chinese Bhikkhuni order was established. In 429 CE, eight nuns on board a ship captain by a merchant named Nandi arrived in China and lived in the Qingfu nunnery in the ancient Sung capital, Nanjing. At that time, the nun Huigo raised a question on whether single Sangha ordination was valid. Due to the presence of the Sri Lankan bhikkhunis, a request for dual Sangha ordination was made. This was agreed to by Bhikkhu Gunavarman. However, as the number of Sri Lankan bhikkhunis there were insufficient to form a quorum for higher ordination, Nandi was requested to bring more bhikkhunis from Sri Lanka. The second group of bhikkhunis led by Bhikkhuni Devasara arrived in China in 433 CE. With the two groups of bhikkhunis, the quorum required for ordination was reached. Together with Bhikkhu uh, Sangavarman, who received instruction from Bhikkhu Guva Gunavarman to proceed with the dual ordination before he passed away, a mass dual ordination was conferred to 300 Chinese Bhikkhunis at the Nanjing Temple in 433 CE. Since then, the Bhikkhuni Sangha in China continues to flourish. China Bikuni lineage has continued to the present day. From China, the Bikuni order was transmitted to Korea and Japan. Later, the Bikuni order further spread to other countries such as Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Let's move to female ordination in the Theravada, Theravada tradition from past to present. The nuns' ordination lineage in the Theravada tradition was extinguished a long time ago. There were a few attempts at revival of the bhikkhuni order in different countries, but without success. At the end of the 19th century, there arose a movement of nuns who live according to only eight or ten rules and devote their lives to pursuing the Buddhist spiritual life on temple grounds. Let's go through the status of female renunciants in some countries in Asia. We start with Burma. In Burma, Dilashin, which means possessor of morality, observe the ten precepts and can be recognized by their pink robes, shaven head, orange or brow shawl, and metal arms bow. There were attempts to revive the bhikkhuni order in the 1930s, 1950s, and 1970s. The latest unsuccessful attempt was in 2005, where a bhikkhuni was sentenced to five years in prison for having been fully ordained in Sri Lanka. After her story was highlighted in international media, 
she was released before serving the full sentence. Fearing repercussions, she left Burma and has not returned. Following her traumatic experience, she dropped in 2008. Tilashin is the only option for women who wish to renounce in Burma. Next, we move to Cambodia. In Cambodia, donkeys observe ten rules. They shave their head, dress in white robes, and often live on temple grounds. They are nonetheless considered like women and not true nuns. There are few countries which have re-established um, <coughs> Bikuni Sangha. In Sri Lanka, <coughs> the Bikuni order flourished through the centuries until around 1017. There is no mention of any effort to revive the Bikuni order. In the early 20th century, ten precept mothers, Dasa Sumata, was established. And Ayok Kusuma is the first bhikkhuni in Sri Lanka after a lapse of nearly 1,000 years. In Thailand, 1927, two women named Sarah and Chongdi ordained as bhikkhunis. However, they were not recognized by the Sangha and the Thai royal family. They were, or the, they were ordered to disrobe because they did not comply. They were arrested and thrown in prison. A law was then created by the Supreme Patriot of Thailand which forbade monks to ordain nuns, novices, or sikamana. Today, there are 10 precept women known as machi who shave their head and wear white robes. The Thai bhikkhuni order has been revived by bhikkhuni Damananda who took ordination in a re-established bhikkhuni lineage in Sri Lanka. Bhikkhuni Santini became the first ordination um, bhikkhuni by receiving higher ordination in the Theravada Buddhist community. And bhikkhuni Leofa is one of the first fully ordained bhikkhuni in the Theravada tradition in Vietnam. Today, many women wish to go forth to become bhikkhunis. However, there is not enough support from bhikkhus from their home countries in giving them high ordination and also from the government. Even when they successfully become a bhikkhuni in their own country or overseas, there is little recognition of their stages and they are not given equal opportunities at bhikkhus especially for training, education, and welfare. Despite all these difficulties and challenges, there are still many women who take the courageous step to fulfill their aspiration to walk this path. Now let us go back in time with Franchini da Silva, who will share with you how the Bikuni order was revived. Thank you. I am uh, Bikuni Kusuma from Sri Lanka. Uh, before my ordination, I was Dr. Uh, Kusuma Devendra, and my ordination was held in uh, Saranath by the Korean Sangha in 1996. I get a frantic call mm. from Sri Lanka mm. from Venerable Vipulasara. Mm. He told me, uh, I am Stop. under fire, all mm. the monks are attacking, mm. this Stop. cannot be done. I am going to cancel this ordination. Nobody is supporting me. Then he told me, then I was, I was doing the research. He told me, unless you take the leadership role, mm and take the uh, responsibility, these nuns are not up to it because this is an international one and a historical event. And then he told me over the phone, mm. either you take it and 
take the leadership and then do it or not uh, do it or else i am going to cancel it then i by that time 150 koreans yes. have already booked their tickets to come to It's india so much to the robes for the ordination <laughs> and me available people sara is trying to uh, back out <clears throat> i said venerable sir Uh, if you cancel this But there will never be another ordination even at the risk of my life i yeah. will join this if you ask me please don't cancel it yes. then he put down the receiver yes. and that was how i was involved into this bikuni ordination yes. so i was invited by venerable vipula sar that yes. there no way yes. that take the leadership uh, the there was a question of whether because I, it is no enviable position for me because i am under attack from all sides i said i have lived enough then i was nearly 69 years i said whether it is at the risk of my life anybody will kill me that's okay So that is how I became yeah. the first bikuni. Yeah, there was no one to take yeah, it. Yeah, because they we selected the ten, and she was the most qualified person. So they said, according to the age, we can make her the leader and send the first as the first so bikuni. This, because of and that, the second ordination was possible in Buddha Gaya. Thank you. I am Pranjani Di Silva. I am supposed to be talking a few words on the revival of the bikuni ordination in starting from Sri Lanka and or now everywhere so when I talk, think of the bikuni first I must pay my gratitude to Ayakema Vendabala Ayakema she who wanted to support the nuns and inspired me uh, to help the nuns Then uh, 1987 we had this conference for nuns conference in Buddha Gaya uh, for all nuns bikunis came from all over the world from all traditions all nationalities and I was invited to attend the conference and there after listening to all the talks I realized that we are not doing our duty towards our uh, nuns who are supposed to be called the Sushil Mata. in future they are called ten precept mothers so, so, so since that time when i went back to sri lanka because i came up personally called my name and ranjani when you go back to sri lanka you have to help your nuns so that and after listening to the talks and our heritage of sangamita theory and the arahat theories in sri lanka in the from the early centuries then i realized we got to help the nuns before that i didn't have have any idea of helping any nuns or we did not have any much respect for the nuns either so that was the condition in sri lanka and uh, they were there sri lamatas but no respect from the community much except those who were very close to them family and friends in the community as in the whole they were not respected so we also were more closer to the monks Uh, so, so since i was awakened by this message i started working uh, and to with the, uh, to help the nuns so immediately when i went returned to sri lanka i invited some nuns and started training in hospital service and uh, invited some nuns to give some uh, residential training and meditation uh, practice and my resource person that time was aya kusuma who was mrs devendra kusuma and few others so i organized some english classes and pali classes and dhamma classes for some nuns then when i talked to them i realized they are also worth of offering all the four requisites to them so since then Uh, after the 87 conference in thailand they had the 91 and i in, invited to have the sec- next conference in colombo i invited next i invite you to 
hold the next conference in Sri Lanka. So I came and everybody was so happy and then I didn't have any organization, nothing but on my own. I just got up and said, I felt that nuns should be accepted and trained and we can take Dhamma to the family. That was my first intention. Uh, Bhikkhuni thing came later, but at the beginning we got to prepare the nuns and accept them in the society and empower and educate them. So that was my uh, first intention. Uh, that was my theme for the, uh, my intention to hold the next conference. So, in 93, I organized the Kalambu conference, invited over 300 Sila Matas and they had the opportunity for the first time to meet the bhikkhunis of all traditions. So, that gave them so confidence. Earlier, they never thought they were going to be bhikkhunis. They never heard the bhikkhuni word and not, it is a prohibited word. When I had to organize the conference, I had to go through a lot of red tape and opposition. So, they really didn't give me the approval first being a women's conference, so I had to go to the back door and get the uh, uh, on, uh, approval. So that was the condition and you know in the society, uh, uh, we had uh, in the Buddhist community, we never had word called Dasasil Mata or Majis or Donjis or til, uh, tila, Tilashin or never, even Amaravati they call Sila Dharani. All these terms were given to these nuns, women who wanted to renounce. What an idea. And our women also, we had no other way than accepting whatever is given to them and they continue to practice and renounce as nuns, Buddhist nuns. No bhikkhunis. Buddha never had these terms. Buddha only gave bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, upasaka, upasika. So, it was our time now to help these nuns to become bhikkhunis. So, after the 93 conference, I wanted, my plea was to accept the Buddhist nuns and give them the four requisites and educate them and empower them, uplift their status in society and they can in turn help the, to take the Dhamma to the family, especially to the women and younger children. I think now it is completely, we have achieved that. So, uh, it was in, uh, 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 then while we were helping the nuns, the monks saw us working with, uh, Kus with Aya Kus Kusuma and I was to get working together. So, one day monks called us and asked, what are you two of you are doing with these Ilamata? So, I said, this is what it is and I gave the background. So, he said, we need some uh, nuns to serve in the Mahabodhi society in India because only we are short of um, monks. So, actually the monks called for applications and we selected 10 nuns to be trained. It was difficult, not everybody agreed to become, go to Buddha. That time no talk, not talking of bhikkhunis. So, anyway, we selected and trained them. Finally, we had bhikkhu, we have a we had to pay respect and great, be grateful to our venerable people Sarathir, who was the president of the Mahabodhi Society in India, who had much connection with the Mahayana bhikkhus in Korea, Japan, everywhere. He was very accessible. So he said, uh, okay, do not give publicity, but on the slide, we will train them and uh, there is no, in the Buddhist community, there is no, nothing called Sila Mata. If they are going, they had to become bhikkhuni. So we, and he said, uh, Anagarika Dharma Palace, uh, uh, diary, it was mentioned that uh, uh, we had to do this and he said as a respect for his 100th century uh, uh, celebrations, he liked to do this. So, he got a lot of opposition, but he said, no, uh, what is right, when I know what is right, I am going to do it in spite of, in spite of all the opposition. So, he had a lot of threats and opposition where Aya Kusum has mentioned in her talk. She nearly withdrew and then I remember when the Bajiburusar was in Japan that time and he gave me a call. I was in Sri Lanka, Kusuma in Korea, he in Japan. So, three of us were really coordinating this event. He said, but is this Kusuma is trying to withdraw. I said, no, nothing going to happen like that. I have already organized all the ten nuns are ready and I have organized Samaneri ordination of Kusuma when she returned at Kalania. I have informed the family, friends, the permission of the monk, everything. So, it's going to continue. So, that was the end of it and we had it. So, 
96 it was with the Korean Sangha, we had this in Saranath. Uh, so, everybody is criticized saying that it is Mahayana. The word Mahayana is my, for the Sri Lankans or the Theravada, they think we are going to bring um, their sasana down or it's a degradation of sasana, the vin again the Vinaya, everything. So, we had a lot of threats in fact. For me, they were saying, Madam, you are doing all this again, the Vinaya and Dhamma. I said, yes, you have been saying these things for the last thousand years. So, and you scare the women and not, this time we are not going to scare, we are going ahead with this, I said, if it is. <coughs> that was the type of threat and I used to get telephone calls and a lot of even my family was dead against because all the Mahanayakas were against. He said, you are doing things against the Mahanayakas. I said, if, if they are not the Buddha, I have my respect for the Mahanayakas, but if they are not the Buddha. So, we go by the Buddha's word. Then, in 96, ordination for the 10 Sila Matas, I travelled to Saranath with the 10 of them. So, we have studied the Pati Mokha before uh, Ayakusuma did that. And translations, all the copies were in our hands, even um, while travelling the train, we were all reading the Pati, including me. And, uh, uh, but Koreans, of course, they wanted to give their own way. So, when I questioned the monk, said, if you want, do you want this or not? I said, yes, I am going to take it. We go ahead. Then he said, then take the way they are giving it. So, I said, <laughs> Bante, they are going to give the Korean robe and our punk. does not matter. You, they can be anything and go. You take the way if you want, take the way they are given. So, we accepted it and we got received the Korean way. We received this uh, ordination, but of course, there was Theravada monks there, including Bante, Piananda from Walpole. Piananda came from LA and we had Pandita Devasiri at Buddha Gaya. So, he, I remember he read the Parajikas to the Bhikkhunis after the ordination and Bhante Piyananda gave, brought the, he was so thoughtful, he brought ten sets of robes and gave it one to the Kusuma and gave me the nine robes to be given to the others and they said, now you can change your to these robes and the walls so that, uh, and that was the, uh, how we got the first ten nuns ordination. Of course, it was publicized in Sri Lanka and it was big news on the television and it, oh, the Bikuni ordination has been restored. Oh, then it became so controversial, the whole uh, Sangha got disturbed and then the articles appeared. Uh, then four, then only it opened, that was nice. It was a dead word, it was an underground thing. We, take it out, we took it out. So, it is now ready for discussion and controversy, which was very good. Then, because earlier, not because they were not that all the bhikkhus were against it, but they were no, not aware of it, it was just, and our nuns also accepted that we, and it is never possible till Maitreya Buddha. So, that is what was told. So, uh, with this opening, there were monks who were criticizing and then, other monks, the Venerable Talali Dhamma Lokatero, who was Saupajaya for all these ordinations, he told me later, he was not in the scene at the beginning, but after this became controversy, he said he took the books from his library and every time he take a book, he get the answer to what he wants and he read three times the Vinaya to find with, uh, whether there is anything wrong with this. He said he never found any. Then he actually sent a notice to all newspapers finally. Show me where I, the chapter and the verse where you say it is again the Dhamma or Vinaya. So, up to now nobody found it. So, that was the end of it and we had Bikuni since then. Bikuni Kusuma was highly criticized and now they some don't want to accept her as a Bikuni, but it was given to them and they accepted and the Avatheravada monks accepted them. Not everyone, but community has accepted them. The acceptance of the community is the acceptance of the bhikkhunis. That's what I was always saying uh, and it happened. Since it was open and done by the Korean, now Fogons and Master Sinyu also very, we have very grateful to him. He had a seminar, he had a meeting. We have a bank, Porogam Soma Lankara Thero went there and they want to have an international ordination in 1998 in Buddha Gaya, the Chinese uh, monks sponsored the event and trained them. So, for that, in the meantime, our Venerable Sumangal of 
Tero, he and this two monks, they trained the 20 nuns and went to Buddha, sent to Buddha Gaya. So, 1998 ordination was done and the Theravada senior bhikkhus gave ordination and that was uh, supposed to be accepted by all the as it, the Buddha's word says, um, the, uh, um, the monks alone can give the ordination. So, the 1980 ordination is now accepted, then 2000 we had another ordina international ordination in Taiwan where we sent 20 bhikkhunis from nuns from Sri Lanka, they also received along with them the Indonesian bhikkhunis, Ayasantini and Silavati got ordination and 2000, so that is how it went to in Indonesia, now she is doing well. In Thailand, 2003 with Ayadamanandas ordination, it was going to Thailand, then Bikuni Lupap from Vietnam came to Sri Lanka and we coordinated. So, we have established Bikunis in all three Theravada countries, Thailand, Indonesia and Vietnam and Sri Lanka and since then it has spread in the meantime. So many Bikku nuns came from various countries and we organized ordinations and there are many Bikunis. Thank you so much. Now you can ask any questions during the uh, on Zoom on the Zoom when we come on, on any questions you want to ask me, I am ready to reply. Thank you very much. Okay, I really wish to thank the venerables for that wonderful presentation and also to Auntie Ranjani for uh, her experience, her direct experience with uh, the revival of the Bikuni lineage in Sri Lanka. Now, I noticed that this was not mentioned by anyone um, about Bikunis who were ordained uh, in the United States and they are now uh, Bikunis in the European countries and also in Canada. So the next uh, um, uh, topic that we are going to talk on is uh, the first bikuni ordination in Australia. Now, I probably am not the best person to talk about it. Maybe I Hasapana and the Damasara nuns may be able to produce a sequel to tonight's presentation. Who knows? It may happen. But briefly, because of the uh, factor of time, um, I'll just mention something which I found uh, from Bante Sujato's Block because Bante Sujato was very uh, uh, quite uh, playing a very uh, what I call um, instrumental role uh, to get the uh, ordination of the Bikunis uh, going on in Australia in 2009. I remember I went to Santi in 2009, the early part of 2009, and I was actually helping uh, Venerable Seri, who was there doing some research, and we were researching into the Vinaya, the Chinese text of uh, the Tripitaka with our very limited knowledge of Chinese, trying to find out the legality of um, bikuni ordination. And of course, at that time, I was very new to Santi. I was very new to the Theravada tradition. I had no idea what was going on, but I was happily happy, helping along with uh, Venerable Seri and uh, with uh, Bante Sujato's help. It was only later on that I realized what I was in for. Okay, but it was really a very good experience for me and that was how it inspired me to help, uh, which I will come uh, to that later on. Now, in um, uh, 22nd October 2009, Okay, that was when it all changed according to Bandir Sujato. That's when the Sangha of the Bodhiana Monastery and Damasara Nuns Monastery, with the support of an international group of bhikkhunis, performed the first Theravada bhikkhuni ordination in Australia and the first bhikkhuni ordination in the Thai forest tradition anywhere in the world. And according to Bandir Sujato, I only knew it last night when I found all this information. From around 2002 or so, I started, that is from Bante Sujato. Uh, Bante Sujato started to speak to the monks about the um, uh, bhikkhuni ordination. He did it in person and he wrote letters, raising it as an issue that needed addressing, right? But uh, uh, not much was actually done during that time. He said that I kept talking, writing, and researching. I focused on three issues, 
right, about the setting up of a nuns community. So it was in 2006 that uh, Ajahn Brahm told him that Ajahn was now fully convinced that Bikuni ordination was the way to go. Right, so during the Vassar of 2009, Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Bayama had a series of discussions where they decided that they wanted to go ahead with Bikuni ordination. They felt that their communities were ready and did not want to have to deal with the kinds of organized opposition that would inevitably follow an announcement of the date. They invited an international group of eight Bikunis to participate, and they were Venerable Stataloka, who uh, was the preceptor, uh, Aya Suchinta and Aya Sobana, who were the reciters of the formal act, Aya Atapi, Aya Santima, Aya Santini, Aya Silavati, and Aya Damananda from Vietnam. Aya, um, Ajahn Brahm and Bhante Sujato, they were the reciters of the acts on the uh, Bhikkhu side, and all the four nuns from Damasara at that time, they were all ordained. And they were Venerable uh, Vayama, Venerable Neroda, Venerable Seri, and Venerable Hasapana. So there you go. Those were the first four nuns um, who were ordained as Bikunis in 2009 in Damasara. So I'll leave it to the Damasara nuns to give us more information and how it developed after that. All right. So. That is the first Bikuni ordination in Australia. I'm quite sure a lot of us read about what happened to Ajahn Brahm after that. It is uh, uh, no, no uh, what do you call, uh, fresh news to anybody. Most of us know, knew what happened. And it all seems to be a blessing, actually. So the next uh, question that I am supposed to, be, to address is, what is the significance of NBM, New Berry Buddhist Monastery? All right, so here we go. What is the significance of Newberry? Now, uh, whatever happens, we always talk about causes and conditions. And of course, uh, we need to go uh, return to our roots of how things uh, started. So according to records that um, we have managed to, to dig up, records show that uh, um, how NBM uh, came about actually was the result of BSV and Sangamitarama. So I do not have the time to really go through all the years of what happened in BSV, but I'd like to really just mention the, the founder members of BSV and Sangamitarama who together, uh, uh, when they worked together um, uh, towards uh, finding a forest monastery and also the support of Bigunis, that was how it happened. So uh, the first um, five founding members of BSV, the Buddhist Society of Victoria in 1953 were Len Bullen, Leslie Oates, Len Henderson, Sidney Hill, and Fred Whittle, right? And, um, and who are the founder members of the uh, Bikunis um, support group? And when and who uh, planted the seed of opening a monastery for the Bikunis? Okay, another thing that is very, very new to me. And um, thanks to Cora for all the information which she passed to me this morning, right? This are the information which probably uh, is very useful for us to, to, to remember. Right, it was at an AGM on 26th of March 2006 at BSV. Um, this was what Cora wrote, or rather, Cora and the group of friends uh, who wrote this while teaching at the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Ajahn Tanasanti from the UK proposes that the BSV give greater support to Buddhism by opening a monastery for bhikkhunis, nuns, and laywomen. A small subcommittee of supporters was then formed shortly after this meeting, and planning started then. So, according to Cora, the group of um, uh, early founder members at this stage, they were Padmini, Pereira, Diana, Watersinghe, Russell, Dunn, Anna Lamaro, Catherine Lovers, Sarath Wirakun, Cora Thomas, Kanti Vijaneita, sorry if I pronounce your, your name incorrectly, and Dr. Jaya Sekara. Okay, now um, 
if there's any names that I've missed out or we have missed out, please uh, do forgive us. We really apologize, right? Um, sometimes uh, things, things like this may happen. Now, and uh, also for um, records and reference, uh, Kora has mentioned that the nuns who first stayed at the first uh, Sangamitarama nuns monastery, right, at uh, 40, number 40, Chesterville Drive, Bentley East, uh, there was a house offered by Dr. Jaya. And it all started in 2007. So the first uh, resident bhikkhuni uh, was bhikkhuni Suchinta from Germany and followed by Samaneri Samachita from Santi Forest Monastery. And immediately after the Vasa, she was joined by Venerable Tania and Venerable Tanasanti from the UK. And the official opening of Sangamitarama was on 27th October 2007. Um, seven monks and seven nuns attended the official opening. The senior bhikkhu from Kisboro, Venerable Vijita, leads the monks who include Ajahn Arya Silo from the BSV, Sayado U Pandita, Ajahn Kemu Badil, and Ajahn Sujato from Santi Forest Monastery. And at that time, uh, Sunim Chikwan uh, was leading the nuns community. Of course, everybody knows who uh, Sunim is. Uh, she's the Korean trained uh, bikuni from nearby King Lake. And she's still supporting us and, uh, at BSV. And uh, we always uh, hope to see her at uh, Newberry Buddhist Monastery whenever she has the time. In fact, this morning we were just communicating and she, I, I'm not sure whether she's actually watching this, this uh, program or not. So in 2008, Venerable Chikwan Sunim, Aya Tataloka from the USA and Aya Sudira from Sydney came to uh, uh, came for a short stay at uh, the Sangamitarama prom, uh, property. And in February 2009, Samaneri Atapi from Sri Lanka came and she was actually ordained in India as a bhikkhuni in 2009. Oh, I think I got it wrong. She came in 2008 and then she went to ordain in India in 2009. And in 2010, Bikuni Damananda, a Vietnamese nun, took up residence as senior nun as uh, Bikuni Suchinta returns to Germany uh, to the Ananja Vihara. 210 Friends of Sagan Mitarama was formed from a small subcommittee to plan and further bring to fulfillment the spiritual vision and practical requirements of the monastery. It is noteworthy that Sangha Mitarama was independently financially supported by friends from its inception. Right, and all these things are actually leading towards what we have now at Newberry Buddhist Monastery. This is the reason why I'm reading this very important facts for us to rejoice in uh, about the efforts that our, our earlier members have put in. Okay, 17th of September 2011, Bhikkhu Jakanada arrives at the BSV for the Vasa. He proposes to the BSV committee that the BSV open a forest monastery based on the fourfold assembly of monks and nuns, laymen and laywomen. 22nd February 2012, Ajahn Brahm, spiritual advisor to the BSV, gives his support for the forest monastery based on the fourfold assembly. March 2012, Bikuni Upeka from Singapore arrives at Sangamitarama as resident nun and offers her support for the vision of the BSV forest monastery and the establishment of a Bikuni community as Ayadamananda left for the USA. On 22nd April 2012, the proposal to set up a forest monastery based on the fourfold assembly and supported by Arjun Brahm receives an unanimous vote at a special general meeting held by the BSV for that purpose. Now, what prompted this unanimous vote at that time? I still remember very clearly that world discussions were ongoing. One question was asked, raised by quite a few members of the uh, uh, community who were present there at the meeting. They were actually asking, why does the BSV need to build a forest monastery when there are so many monasteries worldwide that are not fully utilized? 
And of course, the answer that nuns and female practitioners have few suitable places to go for, for support of training, ordination and practice, it touched the hearts of those present. And I think that really um, um, uh, sort of like won, won them over to support the uh, finding of a forest monastery to be supported fully by the BSV. Okay, so of course the search went on and I think after two years, the property at 107 Beaches Lane, where we are now here, Newberry, named as Newberry Buddhist Monastery, was purchased in February 2014. And monastics from the BSV and Sangamitarama, together with some lay practitioners, moved into the property on 7th of September 2014. Now, there is a Sangamitarama Rama flyer that was designed and printed by persons unknown, date unknown, which actually gave me goosebumps when I read it. I actually found this flyer accidentally when I was clearing Sangamitarama Rama of rubbish. I found this, this uh, flyer. I was asking around who actually, can you see that? Who actually printed it? No one was able to give me an answer. Maybe tonight somebody may recognize it. I'm not too sure. Yeah. This is the one. I'm going to read you the, 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 the vision of uh, this uh, group of people. It's just so amazing. All right. Now this first page here. Our vision. Our vision is to create a secluded residence for women following in the footsteps of the Buddha and his foster mother, Mahapajapati, Gotami, Sangamita, and many other great Arahang Bhikkhunis. We envision a center which offers training for Buddhist women who are ordained or intent to ordain to support the life of women monastics and facilities for lay women to practice temporarily. Our short-term goal, in the immediate short term, we are seeking to provide financial and practical assistance which will allow for the ongoing growth and development of Sangamitarama. Currently, Sangamitarama needs to raise funds about 2000 per month in order to meet current operating costs. Meeting this goal and providing a strong foundation for Sangha Mitarama is key to achieving our long-term goal. Now, what is their long-term goal? Sangha Mitarama is able to remain in the current location until 2014. Can you imagine that? I do not know when this was printed, but they were saying that Sangha Mitarama is able to remain in the current location, which was at 40 Chesterville Drive until 2014. You see the connection? 2014. Our long-term goal is to establish a forest monastery outside Melbourne, a quiet and delightful arama and environment conducive to mental cultivation. Now, that's just so amazing. I really do not know who actually did this, or maybe there's a group of people but it was just so, so, so amazing. According to their uh, um, vision and long-term goal, all these things have led to the founding of Newberry Buddhist Monastery. So this is the significance of Newberry Buddhist Monastery. Okay, so let's see what I have here. Um, Newberry Buddhist Monastery is now six years old. As we are all aware of, this is one of the very rare monasteries in the world and the very first in Victoria to not only support both monks and nuns in training, ordination and practice, it also gives laymen and laywomen the opportunity to experience the spirituality of a monastery environment in a tranquil and forested surroundings conducive to seclusion and mental cultivation. Now, these are just the brief, uh, what do you call, facts that uh, I have right now. And uh, as we all know, the support for the full community is now uh, uh, actualizing. We have already completed the uh, monks boundary and the nuns will have their own boundary uh, within the existing building once the central buildings are 
uh, completed in the central zone. And this is our next phase of construction. So here you go. This is the uh, history of the Bikunis, the Theravada Bikunis, which led to Mahayana and, and so forth. And also uh, answering um, Carl's question of what is the significance of NBM? So NBM is actually going to be a very important uh, uh, place of Dhamma, hopefully to serve future generations of anyone who is looking for peace and happiness, who wishes to become a disciple of Lord Buddha. Although Lord Buddha is not here, his Dhamma and Vinaya, his uh, Sangha, his uh, Dhamma and Sangha, they are still alive. And at uh, Newberry Buddhist Monastery, we hope that the fourfold community will be able to continue the lineage of the Buddha, uh, the Buddha's teachings and his disciples, the Sangha, right? The authentic, hopefully we are learning something that is really uh, authentic without all the uh, rites and rituals involved. Hopefully we are able to go into mental cultivation to, um, to ensure that the, um, the the proper teachings, the, the proper Dharma of the Lord Buddha is really preserved. And the longevity of the uh, dual Sangha, Bhikkhunis and Bhikkhus, are also preserved here in Newberry Buddhist Monastery. So there you go here. This is our uh, contribution for tonight's uh, program. Um, we hope that uh, we have been able to at least give some kind of information which you, you may not have known before. But uh, right now, if there's any questions, you are most welcome to ask the questions. Oh no! Before I before I do that, I have to give you back to a uh, Quincy from a uh, citizen. I'm sorry, Quincy. I took over your role. <laughs> okay, Quincy, all yours now. Thank you so much. Hello. Hi, Aya. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. So um, thank you, Aya, uh, Aya Upeka, Aya Santa, Aya Sivira, Aya Sela, Aya Sankapa, and Ranjani for sharing your stories. Now um, we'll be proceeding with the um, Q and A session. Uh, and yeah, um, for this session, please type in your questions into the Zoom chat box, or for those in YouTube, to type in your questions in the comment section. The question from Aisha. Uh, Aisha, would you like to personally ask the question? Sure, I could just read it. Hello, everyone. So my question is, this journey seems to have been a really long one. What are some of the supports that you think the community can offer to facilitate the continued growth of the nuns in nuns order in Theravada Buddhism? Should I read that again? Sorry. Did you hear um, me? Aya Upeka, did, did you get the message? I didn't actually uh, hear what was being said. I couldn't make out what was being asked. Oh, so, I was, so I was saying the journey to where you are has been a really long one. What are some of the supports that you think our community, so the community outside of the nunnery, can offer to actually facilitate the continued growth of nuns in Theravada Buddhism? Uh, okay, right. Thank you. So what are, are the uh, other support that, can, that may be helpful for our continued uh, 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 sustenance for the lineage to continue? Now, yes. I think in Australia, uh, we, are, we are quite well supported. I would safely say that in Australia. We have a wonderful community out here in, within Australia as well as outside Australia. And I would safely say that mainly because of Ajahn Brahm's uh, influence, Ajahn Brahm's uh, practice and Ajahn Brahm's teachings have actually uh, touched the hearts of many people out there and they have confidence in Ajahn Brahm and also because Ajahn Brahm is our spiritual director. So because of all these connections uh, with a great teacher 
And also because we have a wonderful uh, group of practitioners here who are training uh, to become um, um, ordained nuns here, supported by um, Ajahn Brahm's disciples who are actually supporting nuns at the same time. We have actually uh, Ajahn Nisaruno and um, uh, Bhante Arana Vihari uh, here with us um, on this property. The monks are giving us that support as well as the community out there. So right now in Newberry Buddhist Monastery, I'm, I, I don't know how our other uh, sister nuns feel, but I really feel that we are quite well supported here. Um, perhaps um, if it's like uh, the, the most important thing we need, perhaps what we really need is um, at Newberry right now, okay? I, I can't think of anything um, that is lacking right now for us. I can't speak for other monasteries where there are nuns, but right now at Newberry Buddhist Monastery, I think the most important thing for us is to have a nuns boundary, a bhikkhuni and a nuns boundary where we are properly segregated like what the monks have right now. Uh, that is something that we all look forward to and that will be very conducive and very supportive for us to uh, focus on our training, on our practice, and also to ensure that uh, there is a continuation of the lineage by allowing more people to come in to uh, train and ordain with us. I don't know whether my sister's nuns have anything to say to that. Do you agree? Any objection to what I'm saying? Svira? Okay. Yeah, so I, I feel that right now in Newberry Buddhist Monastery, okay, uh, as I say, I can't say, I can't speak for other monasteries, but right now in New Buddhist, uh, Newberry Buddhist Monastery, the Theravada Bhikkhunis here, we are recognized, we are accepted, we are being accepted uh, by uh, uh, bhikkhus, not all, as uh, uh, Auntie Ranjani has mentioned, because there are certain traditions which are not able to accept us, although personally, the, the certain bhikkhus will accept us, but because of certain, um, I would say, uh, protocols or whatever you call that, yeah, they are not able to openly show their support. But I would say that overall, um, our needs are, are quite well met with and well, well provided. Support is there, respect is there, and opportunities to learn, to practice, and to serve is also there. Does that make you happy? can't hear anything yeah we can't hear did you? <laughs> okay did you hear i hope the answer yeah accepted. i was trying to unmute myself sorry and then i couldn't yes that was good thank you i had a follow-up question what about the nuns in sri lanka are there any oh, partnerships yeah. that you're um facilitating and how can we support them if you are we are we are trying our best to help Andy Ranjani to help support the nuns right now, especially during these uh, times of COVID-19. Perhaps I should present this question to Andy Ranjani to answer it. Ranjani, okay. are you there? Come closer. Okay, come on. You're, you're, you're going. Yeah, I think you have to put me on the screen. Answer. Ranjini, you're on. Yeah, yes. Yes, Sri Lankan nuns are well supported normally, but these days, due to COVID and the natural disasters like floods and elephants also <laughs> ruining their crops and a lot of things happening in outstations. But uh, nuns normally are well supported by the community, even though the government has not fully given recognition. So they will all right. At the moment, there are some in really deserving some help. So I'm really organizing some thing to help them immediately. So they will recognize and community really accept them. Okay, um, when you're finished with your organization, is there any way that you can share that information with the rest of the community so we can support in whatever ways we can? Excuse me, but 
What is the question? It was not very clear to me the question. She wants information on how to uh, how to help, how to support. Yeah, at the uh, I can send the at the moment. I mean, most of the nunnery, they are you, you can't directly contact them. They are far away in far away remote areas. So I have a Sakyadita uh, Sri Lanka. So that is the only way I can help. We have a Sakyadita account there, it's incorporated. So that is the only safe way to do. I have given that link to the Sakyadita Australia as well. Anybody who wish to help, so they can give donations to that account. And our Bikuni, Head Bikuni at the Sakyadita Center in Sri Lanka, she's in contact with those um, areas and remotes. We have found about, uh, about maybe about 20 to 25 nunneries around very far away places. They are really in the, uh, distress at the moment due to these disasters and COVID and people have uh, no employment. People themselves are in difficulty, so no dana and they are due to floods, their kutis have been damaged. And so much, this is the only time, best time to help. So I can, if you are interested, I can give you my, can give you the link. Thank you so much for your, kindness. Thank you. If we can put the link in the chat, that would be super helpful. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Aisha, for the um, question. And um, we have another question for Ranjani. So, Anti Ranjani, there's a question from Live Conquest. Liv, would you be interested to ask the question? Yes. Ranjani, how, how many, approximately, how many Bakunis would now be in Sri Lanka? Would you know? We had... Yes. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, uh, I think it's over 1,500 bhikkhunis already in Sri Lanka because every after our last 20, we started the ordination from 98 onwards. 2000, every year we had ordination in two, three places and every year. Uh, so it, over 20 years, we have nearly over 1,500. In addition, we have been giving ordination to other nuns from other countries as well. I think... <laughs> that should be, I don't know the exact number, but we have around that number. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Liv, for the question. And thank you, Auntie Ranjani, for answering it. Um, I think that concludes our Q&A session for today. Is there any uh, questions from anyone? If there is, um, feel free to unmute yourself. No? Okay, all good then. All right, well, um, thank you everyone for attending the event. Uh, we finally reached um, the end of it. Uh, I'd like to say thank you again to Aya Santa, Aya Upeka, Aya Subira, Aya Sela, Aya Sangkapa, and Auntie Ranjani for sharing your story. We've learned so much about the founder of Bikuni's Ordinaries and how it spread from South Central Asia to other parts of the world, including Australia. And um, I'd also like to thank the citizen committee members, especially Kavisha, Belinda, and Grace, who volunteered actively in the formation of this event. And yeah, so I'd like to make a last announcement before we all go. So Citizen is currently looking for new volunteers to join our committee team for this year until the end of 2022. And um, I'll post the link in the uh, chat box. So yes, um, in case anyone here is um, interested to join or maybe have some one or two relatives that um, might be suitable for this young adults community, uh, please send them this uh, form link and they could join our next committee team. So yeah, 
Uh, more information about it will also be available in our social media accounts in Facebook and Instagram. And um, in the next two weeks, Citizen will be hosting a working bee event at the uh, Newbury Buddhist Monastery. So for those who are interested to join, please keep a look out for our social media and um, we'll post the event details next week. And uh, that's it. That's it for today. Thank you once again uh, to everyone who is present here today. I hope today's talk has been fruitful and inspired each and every one of you to learn more about Buddhism and its history. All good. Okay, see you all again at our next event. I'll pass this back to Aya Santa Aya or Aya Upeka. Thank you, Quincy. So, uh, of course, we have to thank the citizen group for initiating this program and also for all the NBM nuns who have done their part in the research and contributing to us the presentation tonight and to all participants for making this program uh, possible. So before we conclude, we'd like to do a, a dedication of merit chant uh, led by Aya Sunata. So, so is there a mic for... Can we pass the mic to Aya Sunata? Um, uh, there will be the dedication of merits um, to the devas, and at the end of it will be dedication of merits to all our departed loved ones. Please do join us in the chanting. Thank you. Let's all chant together. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Akasata chabumata devanaga mahitika punyantang anumoditwa chirang rakan tuloka sasanang Akasata chabumata devanaga mahitika Punyantang anumoditwa Chirang rakan to desanang Akasata chabumata Devanaga mahitika Punyantang anumoditwa Chirang rakan to mangparang Etavata cha amhehi Sambatam punya sampadang Sape deva anumodandu Sapa sampati sitiya Etavata cha amhehi Sambatam punya sampadang Sape buddha anumodandu Sapa sampati sitiya Etavata cha amhehi Sambatam punya sampadang Sape sata numodandu Sapa sampati sitiya Itang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Itang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Itang mo nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Okay, so good night to everyone. Thank you for joining us. May everyone stay safe, happy, peaceful, and may Newberry Buddhist Monastery be a place for all generations, future generations, uh, as a place to uh, learn the Dhamma, put it into practice, and of course, to be also a source of uh, uh, inspiration for everyone who 
inspires or expires, right? Become a monk or nun. Even if you do want to become a monk or nun, it's okay. Just be here to practice the path and hopefully we will get off samsara as soon as possible. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight. And we'd like to thank uh, all our uh, members of the technology group, uh, those who are behind the scenes. I think Aya Center uh, has been requested to, to uh, acknowledge the um, efforts of all these people who have been working very hard uh, behind the scenes. Thank you so very much. <laughs>